I'm just gonna wing it. And as as we always do on each episode, you know, we're like a uh, a deformed bird. We just try to wing it on different occasions. Deformed bird. So it's a nice image. Welcome back. This is uh, Classroom Hacks, episode two. And today we're looking at. Where's Eric? We have to say our name. Do we? They don't know who we are at this point. We've had one episode and they don't know us yet. Come on, don't you read the papers? Exactly. No, they, we should, because th- this might be the first podcast for it's, it's new true. listeners. Absolutely. You know? We've gone from two listeners now to probably four. Yeah, yeah, that's true. After our parents now are listening. Right, because if they told one person and that person told one person, I'm not in math, so I could say that's probably like negative four people. Negative four people. So, pi, pi r squared. Exactly. Uh, now I'm hungry. So anyway, I'm Eric Tan. And I'm Peter Kanetis. And this is Classroom Hacks, episode two. And today we're looking at student expectations. And students is, is an interesting topic is because students are the lifeblood of any institution. And, you know, we love them. We hate them. Uh, we deal with them. We look at them as our own children at times. And we, we, we try to understand how we can reach them better. And today's episode in terms of students is what do we want students to get out of our own classroom? So, Pedro, when you go into your class and you look at all those bright, shiny, half-asleep faces at 8 a.m., what is it that you want them to get out of a class on any given day? Hopefully, it's going to be more than just the content. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it's more than just what Plato taught, what David Hume thought, uh, or what, uh, if it's a religion class, What are the four noble truths of Buddhism? What are the five pillars of Islam? All those things are important and they're fascinating and we should learn them because they're great ideas to engage with. But as we both know, if if the goal of education is merely content, they don't need to come to school. Mm -hmm. They can go on the internet, hopefully to reputable websites. They could go to the library just to learn information. Go where? (laughs) <laughs> What's that place you, you said? Yeah, it's almost as much of a dinosaur as phone booths, mm-hmm. right? Had a picture of a phone booth in class one time. Students were like, what is that? Yeah, unfortunately, libraries are still around, unlike phone booths. Yes. Yeah, I can't picture libraries going out of, well, do you think they would someday? They've been out of style, but they're just, they're, they're still around. They're, they're still not around. out of date. Yeah, what would uh, an all, like an e-library? Yeah, it's true. Where it would be no hard copies. Imagine how confused the student would be trying to look for an e-library. Can you point me to the direction of the e-library? And what would, what would, would there wouldn't be any shelves anymore. Exactly. There would how be big would it be? Isn't that just basically like a Starbucks? It's, it would be literally a librarian sitting in a chair in a blank room with a tablet and directing the student of where to go. Yeah, what would the librarian's main duties be? I can tell you what they wouldn't be. Restocking books, doing physical things, literally the liaison between this world and the digital one. Are there charges for overdue? I mean, if what, you, would, what would it be overdue what? Exactly. I mean, if you have an overdue ebook, we're we're getting into some really really um fifth element uh, matrix day matrix sort of territory like, here. Okay, let's get back on task. What were we talking? About? Oh yeah, students. Okay, so back to the topic of uh, content and what we hope our students would get. So content is obviously important, but that's that's a, a big chunk, but not the only chunk, right? We want, we want to teach them how to do something. In other words, skills like critical thinking, or as we call them, the soft skills. Uh, so if there's engagement in class, if there's discussion, if there's assignments and activities where they have to be engaged and not just passively sit back and take notes from lecturing. And again, lecturing is good. There are times we need to do it, obviously. But other things where they can learn skills like, I guess, like critical thinking, adaptability, teamwork, cooperation, the willingness to change a view, all these skills they have to take into the marketplace. They have to take into a job. Because when they're being interviewed, this is, as we know, this is what HR people are looking for. So that's, that's another part. And then the third part is what I like to call eulogy skills, is what do we want people to say about us after we're gone? And it's usually not something related to, while they were very good at X, Y, and Z, although that is included in eulogies, but more so, what kind of person were they? Did they, were they a good friend? Did they love well? Were they reliable? Were they courageous? And all this to say is I tell my students, if we can work on, with, 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 with the content, use that as a means to an end, 
to even develop any of these other skills, even just a little bit, it's time well spent during the semester. Am I making sense or am I sounding way too ethereal or talk to me? Not only are you making sense, friendo, you're making dollars. And I think the, the initial point that you brought up about content and learning is crucial, especially in this day and age, because it's information and material and content is available at any corner or avenue that students have access to. They have access to a smartphone. They can get information within seconds. And uh, there was a quote online, and you know, it has to be true because it came from the internet. In fact, Ben Franklin said it himself that students can learn in four hours from Google what they can learn in one month that, from That from was class. Ben Franklin? That was. It was either yeah. Ben Franklin, Mahatma Gandhi, maybe, maybe even Caesar. Yeah. Um, See, those are all very, very intelligent people. But why content is important is because it can it can give information, but it can also isolate because in our day and age with the divisiveness and with all the different platforms and perceptions that people have, it's very easy for them to kind of get locked up into seeing content from their own perspective. And when they come into a classroom, our goal isn't necessarily to say, hey, our, our viewpoint is right, your viewpoint is wrong, but it's to sort of juxtapose their perspective against other students, against other critical thinkers, against experts, against philosophers, against people who have brought different analytical mindsets to the table. And so one thing that I do like to try to get out of class, is, as Peter brought up, to kind of piggyback off that is this idea that, listen, your point of view is valid to bring to the classroom. Your point of view is valid to also have an open conversation about. But what you don't want them to think is that their point of view is the only one that exists. And ultimately, that's a goal that, as critical thinkers, we're trying to get them out there to sort of see. And speaking into the point of when it comes to pragmatic skills for interviews and things, it's not so much that we're going to sit them down and say, this is what an interview is like, but to be able to think on their toes, to see things from different perspectives, to say that, you know, there is more than one answer to a particular problem, especially in these sort of classrooms and this sort of division of liberal arts that we're in. We are conditioned to to look at the world from a variety of different areas and say, okay, sell this to me this way, or how are you going to convince someone to address this situation or buy into what you're saying? and try to really read your audience at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You said a lot of good stuff there, but I'll just pick one spot. You said, we're not teaching them, here's how you interview. Like we're not, it's not an interview class, whether English class or philosophy or religion. But here's, here's a, a specific example. Last week in class, we were discussing the issue of euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide. And I told them the goal of the discussion with all of our class discussions is not that we all agree. I said, but that we give a viewpoint and we're able to give some support reasons for our viewpoint. And just as long as we have the respect there, we can even think a view is wrong or false, but still the respect for the person is there. But now here's the thing. There are people in the class, as you know, who are willing to engage and jump in and maybe they're a bit more extroverted. But then there are students who it's a very... I mean, in some cases, I've had students tell me terrifying experience to speak out loud in class. One thing I do in those cases, not the only thing, but, but tell me what you think of this. The idea where I say to the student, we're going to have to have these skills in life to some way, shape, or form. Think about it. How nerve-wracking a job interview can be. I said, but think about this. If we can practice speaking out loud, taking that risk, that leap, going into the fear, in, a, in an environment where it's safe to do that because I'm not gonna laugh or ridicule you. I tell the students, again, we can disagree, but just don't ridicule, don't laugh at another person in a, in a mean way. Then if we train those skills and practice in here, think how much sharper we'll be when we're out there in the real world. As the old military expression goes, the more we sweat in training, the less we will bleed in battle. Absolutely, and I will respond to that inquiry after our faux commercial break. So again, if you missed our first episode, we have these little breaks in between to speak to our sponsors who aren't necessarily real sponsors, but it's a nice little break for us and a nice little break of levity for you. So we'll be back right after this. Have you ever stopped abruptly in the middle of a hallway, spilled piping hot coffee all over yourself and wondered, what kind of teacher am I? 
It's a good question to consider while you are holding up traffic or getting in people's way. You just might be one of the following types of teachers. The fast talker. The slow speaker. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are well. The Yoda. That is why you fail. The anecdotal educator. You know, that reminds me of a time I spent a night in a Tijuana prison. The teacher who responds to a question with a question. I don't know, Jimmy. Can you go to the bathroom? The reader. Wikipedia defines plagiarism as the wrongful appropriation and stealing and publication of another's author's language, thoughts, ideas, or expressions. The best friend. Hey class, where are we getting hammered tonight? The always trying to think of an example, but can't seem to make a proper comparison instructor. L let's see, uh, Hamlet's to be or not to be uh, is a lot like, hmm. Wait, it's, uh, it, it, it's really a comparison between, uh, hmm, uh, well, honestly, it's more like a dichotomy of whatever kind of teacher you might be, you can always learn to become more robotic and less like yourself. Find out all the tricks of the trade at the Classroom Hack Seminar. Find out what all the fuss is about as you make your way past the conference room's kitchen and into the alleyway behind the Crown Plaza off of 294. Be the first to call and receive free tickets. They're going slowly. Don't delay. Call today. Remember, that's Classroom Hacks with an H. And we're back. And so to kind of respond to... Pedro's question about student challenges. This is something that I think every instructor has had different challenges that they face. And it's really easy for us to kind of hone in on the one or two students who's always going to raise their hand, always has something to say. It's sort of like our go-to student. And if, if I, I can give you any advice, find out who that student is early on and make sure that you know his or her name by heart so that if there's any point where you just need to say, you know what, it's going to be a relaxing day. If so-and-so raises their hand, I'm not going to try to look for anybody else. But when it comes to the opposite kind of students, which tends to sometimes be the majority of the class, where you have more students who might not be as engaged or interactive to sort of challenge them, depending on the type of class, you can take a variety of different approaches. Myself, who is an English teacher, I know that some students have a lot to say, but they're not always as vocal about what they want to express or their uh, opinion about something. So I try to split that up, whether we try to divide them into groups, whether I try to engage them through personal writing, or whether they want to speak to me directly via email or after class. You should try to give them a variety of avenues where they can at least vocalize at some point, whether verbally or through correspondence, what exactly is their issue or what exactly it is where they can learn better. And I know it's tough sometimes, especially when we have certain ways of teaching and you want to try to cultivate something that works for everybody. But ultimately, the, the first way to break down that barrier is to create that open communication between yourself and the student to find out where their learning comes from so you can see if you can sort of adjust to some of their learning practices and they can potentially take on some of your teaching habits. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, what would you, what's a good example of that, would you say, or a recent example, anything come to mind? Of being challenged by a student? Yeah. Or just, I believe it was two semesters ago in the fall of 2015 where we were, we were talking about a topic in class. I, I, was, I, I think it was in regards to either the Black Lives Matter movement or the, the, the extension of the Blue Lives Matter movement. And, you know, I remember a student coming up to me and saying that, you know, he has uh, a father who's a police officer, but he's afraid to kind of speak up in class because he's afraid of kind of getting this backlash from different people or, or being seen a certain way to say that, well, he doesn't believe in civil rights or doesn't believe in these different things. And, you know, it was a valid point. It was a valid thing for the student to be sort of fearful of, especially with some of the different approaches that have been going on with the discussion. And the same can be said for someone who is a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement, and they get backlash from different areas as well. And this was the opportunity where 
attaching an assignment to something like that or a reading of something of that sort to connect with what you've done in the classroom so that the student can voice their individual opinion while still maintaining a connection to the topic from the class through an extension of either homework or a homework response or something else that they can still feel like their voice is heard even though they might not have been able to speak up in class. Yeah, that's a nice way of doing it. I learned this a long time ago from a professor I had in grad school and I never forgot it because I thought it was so right on the money. Well, he was talking about the issue of tolerance and what tolerance really means and he made this point saying tolerance doesn't mean that no one is right and no one is wrong. Tolerance doesn't mean that everyone's that all views are true. He says tolerance doesn't mean that all ideas have value. Tolerance means all people have value. I mean, let's face it, some ideas are wonderful, beautiful, helpful, noble. But as we know, we don't have to think very long to see that some ideas are silly or destructive or horrific. And we can just think of either our own lives or look at human history. In regards to student challenges and successes, can you can you think of any examples where you felt challenged by a student where maybe you didn't live up to what your class expectation was and an example of a student who you feel really gained something from your class or maybe said something positive about what you sort of taught them from class? A good example where things turned out well or where I, or I walked out of class that day thinking, we're achieving the the big picture here of learning how to be better thinkers and hopefully in some ways better people and that's teachers included i mean none of us are going to admit we have no room to grow in any area of life that's why i tell my students i said all these things we do in here is as much as for me as it is for you here's the most common example where something and not even i said but another student said during discussion that made other students think in such a way where they say this out loud I had never even thought of that. And so what it's done is it's rocked the world of that student, but in a good way. Because sometimes the idea and what they mean by, oh, I've never thought of it that way before, is one of two ways where it bolsters what they already think is true about the issue, or it challenges, it goes against their current view. And the goal isn't like everyone must walk out of there with new views. But just to to think, to evaluate, it's the old Socrates saying, right, the unexamined life is not worth living. So I've had students say out loud, and to me, even during office hours, something someone said really opened my eyes or gave me a new perspective or challenged me to think deeper or challenged me in such a way where I started looking for answers to their point. So that made me think, that makes me so happy. That, that's the gold, I think, as a teacher. Now, unfortunately, on the other end of things, many bad examples or bad experiences where I I dropped the ball and it it didn't go well because of uh, some inadequacy on my part. An example of that is when a student isn't on board, when he or she doesn't really care about engaging or doesn't care, doesn't seem to care about the overall goals of the class. And so they're complacent, they're apathetic, they just sit there, slouched in their chair, and the shortcoming for me was I look back and think, you know, I didn't make the effort I should have to reach or connect this student. I mean like little things. To talk with him or her more before class. Hey, how was your weekend? Any good movies out there? Are you a Cubs fan? Do you prefer dark or milk chocolate? I mean, whatever it is. Because I let my own attitude get in the way. My own where I'm thinking to myself, okay, buddy, fine. If you don't want to be on board, You know, it's your money, you paid for it, you can just sit there. And I look back thinking, ah, Pete, you dropped the ball. You let your own, either your own ego or your own pride get in the way. Can you relate to that? Absolutely. And I would say that ego and pride for any individual, teacher or student alike, is the sort of mental block that will prevent you from becoming better, from learning from your own mistakes, from really progressing as an educator. And early on here at uh, College of DuPage, I was teaching in one of the rooms where it was literally like a gym closet, where we were in the basement, there was no sunlight, we are surrounded by basketballs and different sorts of sports equipment, and the tone of the classroom was sort of mixed. But I did have one student in there 
who was clearly above and beyond many of the topics that we were talking about, highly intelligent, and would always try to find like loopholes in my teaching methods or in the things that I've done. So for instance, one of the things I like to do is make any of the PowerPoints we cover in class available online, or any of the material that we cover just available so that students can reference it if they need any outside assistance. And he brings up the point of, if you're going to cover the exact same thing online, why would I need to come to class? And in the moment... Did he ask you this out loud in front of others? He asked me this at the very end of class. So okay. I don't know how many people heard it. Okay. And getting ready for the, the usurpation and the rebellion to come. But fortunately enough, they only lit one lamp. So that means they were coming by sea. Uh, <laughs> sorry, the history, the history teachers should get that one. After class, he talked to me, and he could tell that I was perturbed by by the, the point of discussion. And he's like, please don't be mad at me. You know, I, I wasn't trying to call you out, but it was just a legit question. No, and I actually had to take a step back for a second because I said to myself, it is a legit question, though. He didn't, he didn't point out something that wasn't untrue. He didn't say something that was a complete knock on how I teach, but he did point out something that I had to take into consideration going forward. And so what exactly can I offer in my classes that could potentially not just be different, but also be connective to what I post online, but also be different enough so that when they do come to class, they don't feel like they're just getting a regurgitation or a repeat of something that they can have access to later on. So. As time went on, I adjusted from that. I learned from that. I learned how to balance out my classes from what I post online so that students who may miss class can still get information online, but then also benefit the students who do come to class because they get that extra information that is crucial to them learning or crucial to their essays or crucial to any quizzes that they might take in the future. On the flip side of that, the positive note, and we kind of addressed this in the first episode, is what exactly our expectations are of, of ourselves from teaching. In two instances, I had students who weren't always the best workers, meaning they didn't necessarily always do their assignments or they didn't necessarily turn in all their work, but they came to class every day. And I'm sure some of you have these types of students where you question, well, why don't you do the work, but you come to class, you engage regularly. And this is where sometimes we have to look beyond them as students. And we have to always remember that they have lives outside of school. And these two students in particular were dealing with a lot of home issues, a lot of things going on in their own personal lives. And at the end of the semester, one revealed through email and one came to me and spoke to me physically after class. And they both said the same thing, that the class was really their one escape for the day where they really felt they could be themselves or they felt like they didn't have the anxiety or pressure hmm. of a lot of different things. And is a reminder to yourself that being a teacher as we talked about in episode one, is more than just providing content. It's being a place where people can come to and have a sort of, and I, I think safe space is going to take on the wrong connotation, but they're going to have a place that they can open up and they can express themselves without the fear of being judged or the fear of having to deal with outside worldly pressures. And remind yourself every day that you are more than simply just an information machine, that you're also a counselor you're also a guide you're also a point of a coach exactly a point of reassurance for many of these students who might have an opportunity to express themselves in a way that they don't get outside of here so always remember that about the type of impact that you might have on a student going forward and thinking i when you were <clears throat> saying that i think one of the biggest challenges for a teacher it's when to exercise justice and when to exercise mercy because mm -hmm. life requires both and teachers need to exercise both if we err one if we err too much or i should say go too much in one or the other i think we uh, lose our you know efficacy as ooh, that's when efficacy yeah. that's kind of cool and then the funny thing is i heard a quote over the weekend that was um <coughs> speaking about justice and mercy is that Honesty without tact is cruelty. 
Hmm. So this sort of thing is striking that balance as we've been talking about. This is kind of going to wrap up this particular section about students and our own expectations for class. Students, obviously, is a very big topic to cover, so I'm sure we'll be approaching it in different episodes in the future, whether that's in regards to student mirth or student failures or student expectations in different areas as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a teaching podcast. Students are going to be talked about every podcast in some way, shape, or form. For next time, kind of going into a spot of interest and intrigue for both Peter and myself, we're going to be looking at ethos and pathos and kind of addressing where you might have applied those particular sort of aspects or elements into our assignments and also kind of and don't utilizing forget, don't it. don't forget logos. And logos, you know, what is our logos here? What is our, our, our logos for this particular podcast? Do we do we have a, a logo? Oh, you said logos, not logos. Logo. Yeah, yeah, not logo. Yeah, there I am. Or hey, Lego, my logos. Exactly. We got plenty of dad jokes on this podcast as well, so don't forget that. And ironically, neither of us are dads. Yes, uh, we're fathers of you know 150 students throughout any given semester. That's that's how I look at it. We are the world. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this has been classroom hacks. Try not to take teaching too seriously. Or taking teaching seriously, but ourselves lightly. There you go. How's that? Maybe that'll be our tag. And what was the quote you said last time? Do we have to give Paul Newman? Yeah, what was the quote? Oh, I don't know. The estate of Paul Newman. The estate of Paul Newman. Right, right. What was the Paul Newman quote again? Uh, Take take your work seriously, but yourself lightly. Very good. And that's what we try to do every day. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.